Hi everyone, this is Heather. It's weekly Q&A time. This is so fun. I'm gonna dive right in. My friend Brooke asked a little bit earlier this week. She said, good morning. My neighbor is looking for a dress for her maternity photos and does not want to spend a ton of money on something she might only wear once. Any recommendations? And I like this question because for people that shoot maternity sessions, this is probably going to come up quite often where your client needs outfits or a dress that maybe is not typically in her wardrobe. So there were a lot of good comments. I mean, you can look at, you know, some people were posting Target or Where's the other, there were other comments, TJ Maxx, cover-ups, but my friend Lisa, hi Taryn, thank you, thank you. My friend Lisa posted borrowforyourbump.com. Have you heard of this? They have maternity clothes for rent, which I think is brilliant because you wanna look good when you're pregnant, but you don't wanna spend a ton of money on clothes that you're not gonna need after the pregnancy is over. So I think that's fantastic. I did not take a look at this particular site, but she said there are also other sites like it. So if you just go to the Google and type in maternity clothing or dress it, rental or something of that nature, um, you'll find probably a couple of sites that do that. I think that's a great idea. Also, if where whatever city or community you're in, if you are friends with other photographers, you can network and work together to share these items. So my friend Mara from Pix by Chicks Photography has an enormous collection, enormous, ridiculously big collection of lingerie for her boudoir sessions. She has a giant clothing rack. I always comment it when I'm there, uh, comment on it when I'm there because she has so many nice things. But I borrow dresses from her that work for maternity sessions. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a maternity dress. You could get a wrap or a sheer lace dress that's just kind of stretchy. She has some things and I mean, there are a ton of photographers in the Pittsburgh area. If you make some friends, you could network and borrow clothing and Taryn says she just looked at the site real quick and they do have some cute dresses, but it's not cheap either. <laughs> How much does it cost to rent a dress? Because at some point you'll look at that rental fee and think, hmm, maybe I should just go to Target and find something or buy it. Anyway, I just thought that was a good tip to check it out and um, also network with your friends and other photographers. Okay. So the next question uh, my friend Katie said, is there a cheat sheet or checklist for monitor calibration? I've never done that before. So we've talked about monitor calibration in the past and so there are other videos that I have on that. But essentially, my method for monitor calibration goes loosely like this. If I get a new machine, which by the way I did, I got that iMac not too long ago, I will edit some photos from different situations, different lighting scenarios. Uh, and I will also order one black and white. So one black and white, and maybe four or five photos from different lighting situations. I'll order those from the lab, and I'll wait for them to come back. I'll correct them, of course. I'll wait for them to come back, and I'll look at them. And I'll say to myself, how do those photos look? Do they look good? Oh yeah, they look like I expected they would look. Great, fantastic. <laughs> that door that just magically opened is a result of Trooper. He isn't here. <laughs> Anyway, if I get the prints back and they look good, then I will consider my monitor to be calibrated appropriately. If I get the prints back and I look at them and, I, and I'm disappointed or I think, whoa, that's not what I anticipated at all, okay, then I have an issue. If that's the case, I will go through using the method of software calibration that comes just with your operating system. So I know in the Mac OS, you can go to the settings and monitor calibration and you can change it there. You can step through the little wizard and make adjustments and then once you change it, edit the photos again, order prints, repeat. You just keep repeating this process until they look right. Now after I've done software calibration, if I get the prints back and they look right, fantastic. But if they don't, then it might be time for hardware calibration. Something like a spider or a color monkey, which is a physical device with a little optical eye, sometimes has suction cups or just weights. You put it on your monitor and you let it calibrate the colors 
uh, I would say in a more scientific approach rather than just your eyes like oh yeah it looks a little blue uh, it would do it a little bit more accurately but I wouldn't suggest going that route unless you absolutely need to so if the prints come back good then who cares and if they don't then you need to follow those steps she also asked if there were any suggestions for a dependable external hard drive Mine has started acting up and I want to replace it before it creates a crisis. By the way, you can start to sense when these things are going to happen. At least I can. If something strange starts happening when you're working on your computer or your drive, then you'll know that mm, maybe that maybe something's about to happen to that drive and I need to get a new one, make sure everything's backed up, etc. Taryn says, is it bad that I have not calibrated any of my computers? I've always been happy. Not bad at all, Taryn. <laughs> if the colors look good and the prints come back fine, who cares? We're not pixel peepers here, are we? Nope. Okay, so back to the hard drive question. She says, does anybody have recommendations for dependable external drive? I've always had really good luck with Western Digital and the Lacy brand. Um, sometimes I call it Lacy because I like lace and that sounds pretty, but I think it's technically Lacy. Can anybody confirm or deny that? Hmm. It doesn't matter. I like that brand. They have a rugged brand that's in a case. I like the idea of this hard drive being in a protective case if you plan on traveling with it. If it's going to sit on your desk like mine does, mine sits over there behind my iMac and it never moves. Um, I don't, does it need to be in a rugged case? Not really, it doesn't hurt it, but you need to protect those drives. So I don't have any real strong feelings one way or the other. I've just had really good luck with um, both of those brands. So hopefully that helps. Okay, make sure you check out the post from Susie this past week about getting clients and how you talk and you create momentum in your business. That was pretty good. My friend Krista says, I haven't done a morning session in a while. What's the best time nowadays for the morning? We will be at Station Square. So Station Square is an area um, in Pittsburgh in the city and Kristen responded and said 7 a.m. is good for light and that's early. Whew, that's early. I will say, by the way, I'm not afraid of early. I get up at 5.30 but to be in the city four seven seems a little bit of a stretch for me but anyway I've noticed that when I'm getting ready in the morning yeah, that Sun is starting to shine through those trees at that really low angle around that time maybe even a little bit sooner and it is beautiful now that being said obviously I know the direction of the Sun at my home I shoot here I know that's east that goes to west if I were shooting somewhere else I'd want to figure out where east and west was and what could potentially be blocking that light and that sun so i kind of like to scout locations and look on a map and see north south east west and try to make somewhat of a determination around what time would be best i myself am not a fan of sunrise sessions um, i don't think people always look their best first thing in the morning I know, I think Taryn's done them, I know several of you have done them, and they're beautiful, don't get me wrong. I would just obviously prefer for the evening light. Um, it just seems a little bit softer to me than the morning light. That could be a personal preference because when you're shooting in the morning, you tend to be racing against time. Not that you aren't in the evening with Sunza, of course, but I just feel like as that sun goes up, it just gets harsher and harsher and people start squinting. Um, <laughs> Taryn says I am obsessed with sunrise sessions because you can get fog oh that's true you can get fog you should post a couple of those maybe after the video Taryn and show everyone your beautiful sunrise sessions they are really pretty okay Jessica says I give my clients all digital photos on a flash drive when editing in Lightroom is it best to keep them all at 4x6 or is it okay to change some to 5x7, 8x10, etc.? So I actually have a really strong opinion on this subject. Now a lot of things that I go over like Canon, Nikon, JPEG, RAW, who cares? It doesn't matter. But if you're going to deliver files to your client, I would always, always recommend delivering them in the original aspect ratio and what I mean by that is when and if I crop in Lightroom in order to enhance the composition of the image I will always maintain the original proportions and that's because if I were to crop everything to say an 8x10 then 
would I also have to give them a folder of cropped to 5x7 and 4x6? Like, what? No. I mean, to start to think through the logistics of that, it really does not make any sense. So for me, always at the original original ratio, which is a 4 by 6 ratio, 2 by 3 out of the camera, and then I crop at the lab level, and the client would do the same thing. And what I mean by that is they stay the same. I crop them for composition, but they stay the same ratio. When I upload to say White House Custom Color and I order 8 by 10s it will give you the option to view the crop and move the crop if you need to because it will indeed crop the image. So I do that at the lab level always, never at the client level. I think you'll just confuse them more. And sometimes it can still be confusing how that works for clients. I actually have a graphic, I have a video, I will post it. It's on uh, the Flourish Academy blog where I explain the cropping issue and I have an example showing photos so that you can really see. So hopefully that helps. I would recommend maintaining the original aspect ratio. Okay. Moving on. Hey, and because I can see comments today, which is awesome, make sure you're typing any thoughts or questions so that I can respond to them. Because once I finish the formal questions, if I don't see anything, yo, I'm out. Okay. Kelsey says, how do you find ideal clients that suit your style of photography? I am a lifestyle photographer and most of my clients want posed family photos. I struggle with posing and I find people don't have genuine smiles when looking at the camera so I find it frustrating and I am becoming less confident. Oh, There's a whole lot at play here Kelsey. Um, first of all I think as a portrait photographer and a family photographer even if you are lifestyle you need to get a handle on posing so that you feel confident doing it because I think even if you promoted that you were a completely lifestyle photographer I personally feel like I owe it to my clients to get at least one, if not more, good images where they're looking and connecting with the camera because it's traditional and people want it. It might not be my style, but it, it will be in style forever. People will want photos of themselves looking at the camera. So have a few poses that are your go-to family poses, but maybe those aren't the ones that you share on your website or you share on Facebook because the bottom line is you will get what you put out there. So if you put out a bunch of lifestyle looking images, then the right client will start to be attracted to you. You know, the old adage is you should either be attracting or repelling clients. And you can't please everyone, of course. And if you're attracting the wrong people, you may be putting the wrong photos out there and they're getting the wrong impression. So for instance, you will rarely to never see a really family formal wedding photograph on my blog but of course I take them. I have to. They are the most important part of the wedding. I have them and they are excellent. They are clean. They are well posed. They are perfectly lit. Those are good family heirlooms. I am required to do that. It is my professional responsibility. But that's not largely my style. So you need to do it. But you also need to deliver what's your style. So Taryn says... I totally agree. I am lifestyle, but I always, all caps, do a few posed photos, but I rarely share them. That is the exact approach I'm talking about. You want to share what you want to get. So if you're being true to your style and who you are as an artist and yourself, you will start to attract the right people. If you're attracting the wrong people, it is because you are putting the wrong vibe out there. You're putting something out there that is maybe incongruent to either your style or to who you are as a person. And when you try to do that and it doesn't fit, it causes this like cognitive dissonance amongst clients and they're like, who is she or is she this or do I want that? And then they come to you and they say, can we take this posed family photo? And you're like, oh, that's not what I want. Well, you have to do it. So learn how to do it and get confident in that way. That way it won't scare you anymore. I mean, I remember starting out I didn't love those formal photographs at the altar after the service, but 
If I were to become a good wedding photographer, I knew I had to master them. Not only did I need to master them technically, but I had to get really efficient because usually I have to get them done very, very quickly. And I would consider myself very well versed in family formals at the altar now. I can get them done very quickly because of time constraints and I make them perfect because they're really, really important to my client. But that's not what I show on my website. So hopefully that helps, Kelsey. Share what you want to get and then you'll start to attract the right people. Joy says you can catch moments in between my clients and I loving them. Yes. So what Joy is saying is you say to everyone, hey, look at the camera. You have them like lined up perfectly and everybody posed. They can look, they connected the camera. You take a few shots and then you say something funny or you say something that I don't know, catches them off guard or causes any type of reaction and then you capture those moments. And the key to making those look more authentic is maybe maybe you're shooting straight on for these formal-ish photographs. You say something funny, step to the side and get them at an angle looking at each other and laughing. And sometimes I will literally say, could you look at each other and laugh because I'm super bored here. <laughs> And I say it in kind of a funny way and then they laugh and I remember Jerry Gohinas He has a couple of things that he says when he has bridal parties lined up He'll have them all lined up perfectly and smiling and nice and then he'll say okay I want you to turn to your partner because so like he'll have the guy and the girl that walked down the aisle together Standing next to one another so it's not girls on one side guys on the other They're all kind of mixed in and he'll say I want you to look Look at the partner that escorted you and they'll look and he'll say, okay, now on the count of three, I want you to kiss them passionately. And he'll say, go, 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 go. Okay, well, a lot of these people are not couples, so he'll get a reaction. They'll laugh. Every once in a while, they'll kiss. Whoops. But it's funny. Or he'll tell someone to grab someone's behind or something like that. And he'll get a reaction and it's funny. So hopefully that helps. Jody says, how do you respond to a client who thinks that they don't want prints? How do you find the balance of giving information without being pushy? So I'm going to read that question again. How do you respond to a client who thinks that they don't want prints? I'm a little mm, about that question, Jody, because you're saying they think they don't want prints. So you are assuming that they do want prints. Is that correct? You're saying they think they don't want them, but you're assuming that they do? or you want them to want them. I need a little more clarification on that question as I always like to say, I need more data. <laughs> I mean, if somebody says they want digital files or if somebody says they want prints, then um, I'm gonna go ahead and believe them on that one. I'm thinking that's probably what they want. Now, I think what you might be asking is, how do you give someone what we believe they need in the context of what they think they want. So what, what we need them to have, but what they think they want. Okay, they don't think, they know they want it. So how can I, how can I add value, but make sure that I am providing a service as well? And in terms of a service, I believe that the best way to enjoy photography is through prints, albums, and wall art. That's my personal opinion. They don't do us any good if they sit on our hard drive. I think we could all agree to that. But if somebody wishes to purchase the high resolution files, then I think you should sell them. Now, obviously, there is an enormous debate on the interwebs about whether or not you should sell digital files. And I personally think that you should. That's, but I don't, if you don't want to, that, I mean, that's fine. You run your business how you see fit. But if my client is asking me for the digital files, I'm gonna sell them for sure. But I'm gonna make sure I understand the opportunity cost. That is, what am I losing as a result of letting those files walk out the door? And how can I be compensated for that? But also, how can I provide a service to my client so that they have a family heirloom that is actually a physical print or wall art that they can look at? And that's a matter of getting really clear in your business model and how you structure it. So if you really want people to have wall art, prints, or albums, then your packages need to be structured so that that is the most attractive way to, to get your services. So maybe that means that these packages are available and the files are purchased separately and they're $1,500. You can get all of the high resolution files 
but they're $1,500. But those files will be included if you spend up to, I don't know, make up a number, two or $3,000 on wall art and albums and prints, and then you can get those files. So why not just get all of these products and then you'll have the files included. I mean, that's that's a really big question because it speaks to your pricing model and how you structure it. It seemed like a simple question at the beginning. How do you respond to a client who thinks they don't want prints? Okay, maybe they don't want prints. Maybe they want to do them themselves. Um, you respond appropriately. That's how you respond. <laughs> you respond with your pricing and your model and either they go for it or they don't, and that's okay. But you have all of that established ahead of time. So you should have your pricing and your model, and you should say, here's what I offer, and either they are going to agree with that and hire you, or they're going to go elsewhere. It's really that simple. I don't think, I think we put too much thinking behind it because we wanna please everyone, and that's just not a good solid approach for running a business. You have to have a process, a system, your pricing developed, in order to present it to someone. Now, there are outliers, and yes, I am flexible. So if I decide I wanna do something that's outside of my typical standard packages or offerings, then I can do that because I'm the boss of me. So I'm not suggesting that you set these policies and these systems and this pricing and you're rigid. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you know what the desired outcome is for you, for your client, and for your business and then you respond appropriately. But if somebody doesn't want prints, I mean, I don't know that all of the information in the world is going to convince them otherwise if they think they just want files. Certainly, we could all work together to help educate our clients, but ultimately, they're big boys and girls and they can make their own decisions. Laura says, I was just going to ask about digital files. How do you determine how much to charge, how many to give? I have not sold digital files yet, but I am losing clients because I don't. P.S. If you already did a video on this. Yeah, I, I mean, I talk about it every once in a while, Laura, but how much to charge is dependent on what your per session income goals are, sales goals. What are your per session sales goals? So if you want to make X number of dollars per portrait session and you do that through prints, albums, and wall art, but somebody wants the files, then the files are going to be as much more expensive than those packages because of the opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost is that once those digital files walk out the door, you will probably not see additional orders, which is fine. You just have to price them appropriately. I always make jokes about Heather's happy price and I'll say, I have a happy price for everything I do. This price would make me feel good about this. So if I were doing a portrait session, um, I'm gonna give just some really loose examples, and I wanted to make, say, $1,600 per portrait session, then I would have a creative fee and I would have packages, and those packages would have maybe those prints or those albums, and then I would have digital files as an add-on, and those digital files would be 15 or $1,600, and they could go straight for that, and I would make $1,600 and I'd be happy. But I am cutting off my sales at $1,600. And see, if you're gonna do in-person sales, but even if you're not, there's no limit. If you have your products priced appropriately, that sale could be three, five, seven thousand dollars $7,000, and then you just capped it at $1,600 with those files. I think that you need to have the ability to offer those files. Oh, you guys, it really depends on your business model, your structure, your clients' needs or what they want and how you're going to approach this. Early on, starting out as a brand new photographer, Heather equals simple. I would go up to a friend on the street who would say, dude, will you take photos of my kid? And I'd be like, yeah, you got 50 bucks, so I'll give you the files. They'd give me 50 bucks, I put it in my back pocket, I'd take some pictures, right? I, I mean, then it just evolved from there. I think the pursue simple rule would say to just start simple so that it makes sense for you and your clients and then build it from there after you determine your business model, what you want your structure to look like, how you wanna make money. You just wanna make sure you're profitable, I guess is the bottom line, because uh, a business makes you money and a hobby costs you money. Isn't that the truth? Okay, if you have any other questions, please post them below. 
And the last thing I want to talk about are the ticks. So if you saw my video yesterday on the Flourish Academy page, and by the way, did you know that we post a live video every weekday? There are 88, I did episode 88, there are 88 videos. They're really brief and you can just jump on there and watch them whenever you'd like. But anyway, in yesterday's video, I talked about ticks because it's spring in Western Pennsylvania and ticks are always a problem. And I had talked to my insurance agent earlier this week and I said, Hey, I take clients into the woods. If someone gets a tick and ends up with Lyme disease and then sues me because they can't work, am I liable? Let me rephrase. Actually, what I said to her was, I don't want to be liable. I want to make sure that my liability insurance covers that. She said, okie dokie, and she got to work on my policy, which we were just, we we're still working on. Anyway, I got off the phone with her about 30 minutes ago, just prior to jumping on this video, and she gave me some information, but I am going to start with a giant disclaimer. I am not a lawyer, I am not an accountant, and I am certainly not an insurance agent. You need to seek professional advice and help and not listen to me other more, uh, more than or beyond entertainment <laughs> because you need to have a real person helping you. That is my disclaimer because I don't want you suing me. Then I have to make sure that my policy covers your craziness. Okay, so she said basically it ends up like something like this. In general, in terms of liability, is there something that you are doing in which you have, and I quote, the duty to protect your client, number one, and number two, did you breach that duty? All right, so then it's gonna get confusing, right? Because you're gonna start throwing all kinds of scenarios at me that I'm not going to be able to answer. But in the case of the tick, is it your duty to protect your client from a tick? And if a client got a tick and got sick, did you breach that duty? So are you liable? And because then it comes down to negligence. Were you negligent on something? So she suggested, for instance, this is not legal advice, for instance, if you are photographing with clients and you are in a wooded area, she said that maybe before you step into that area, you say, okay, are all parties agreed that we are about to go into the woods where there could possibly be danger? Are all parties agreed to that? Yes or no? And I would make a joke about it. I would put on the most serious lawyer voice you have ever seen. And I would say, are we all agreed that we're going into the woods where there could be lions and tires and bears? Are we agreed to that? If they say yes and they laugh, okay, anything that happens in the woods, then I, uh, I am not liable for. But we're all agreed that we're going into the woods, right? And as a responsible adult or a human being, you know the dangers that lurk in the woods. All right, she didn't say all that. I said all that. All she said to me was, are all parties agreed to go into the woods? I'm reading it, I took notes. Are all parties agreed to go into the woods? And then you go into the woods, if something happens to the client, they have accepted that responsibility. Now where you could find yourself in a potential bind is if, let's say you have a senior session and you say to your client, hey, let's go over in that little wooded area over there and she says, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of the woods, I'm scared. I don't know that I wanna do that. And you say, oh, you know what? We really should because it's beautiful. Look at the way that tree and that, and she's like, oh, okay. All right, you just could have potentially breached your duty. That's negligence because she did not want to go into the woods. If somebody says to you, I don't want to do that, you immediately have to say, okay, absolutely. I respect that. We'll just shoot right here. So if a bride does not want to do something and you encourage or coerce her to do so, you could be stepping into dangerous territory. Now, if you convince her to do that and she does it and nothing happens, okay, no harm, no foul, right? The problem is when something happens, if she falls, if she gets injured, if she gets a tick, then you just breached your duty because they told you, the person told you that they did not want to do that. So, uh, that's one thing. Don't be negligent and make sure you are asking people if they are okay. Are you okay? By the way, I learned this a long time ago. If you are instructing people by physically touching them, before you do that, you should say, is it okay if I touch you? Uh, I said it, was it 
last night I had a shoot, no, the night before, uh, Jordan and I had a shoot, and it was a maternity, and she was standing there, and everything was real pretty, and I needed to fix her sweater a little bit, and I said, may I adjust your sweater? And she said, of course, and so I just pulled it over. You need to ask people's permission before you touch them, or before you place them somewhere, and just don't assume that they're okay with it. So the question here is twofold. Do you have a duty to protect and have you breached that duty? Now let's say for instance you put a tripod in the middle of an aisle at a ceremony or for family photographs, which I do. Not for the ceremony, but I do for the formal photographs. I use a tripod. If my tripod is in the middle of the aisle, which it is, and grandma comes up to get her photo taken and trips and breaks her hip, and you know what happens once an old person breaks their hip, they go into the hospital, they get pneumonia, they die. Okay, so you don't want that to happen. If something like that happens, did I have a duty to protect her, i.e. not have my tripod in the out? The answer to that is yes. Did I breach that duty? Yes, I did. I'm negligent. So I would be liable for that. So then the question is, okay, if I'm liable, because of negligence, do I have appropriate insurance to cover that liability if it went to, say, a court? and you would have to work with your insurance agent on that. If you don't have insurance, depending on where you're at in your business, maybe you're starting out, I'm not sure, you are potentially playing with fire. I would highly recommend getting insurance. And if you say, well, I'm not a real business yet, you are, you're operating as a sole Sorry, my phone rang. You are operating as a sole proprietor and you could still be liable for things. And worse than that, if you're operating as a sole proprietor, you have liability, which means your personal name and your personal assets could be on the line. I don't want that, I don't want that. So that's why I have an LLC, that's why I have insurance, that's why I have an attorney and an accountant. <laughs> I just did a video on the page before I jumped on here. The three people you must have in your life, you must know an attorney, an accountant, and you must know somebody in the insurance realm. You must. Who are, who are you gonna call? I pick up the phone and I call these people when I have questions like this, and I say, what if, what if, and then they answer, and then I can sleep at night. Florence says, I have gotten a tick on me in an urban setting, true, just by a planter with flowers, also using DEET. I do not, I do not repel ticks, but some people find that acceptable, but I use essential oils to repel ticks. Okay, so she uses, I talked about oils yesterday, and I said, listen, if you want to use your oils, if they work and they repel, that's fine. I'm going for straight up poison. I'm saying put a Soresto collar on me or let me go swimming in some deep. Okay, I'll spray it on my ankles. You should have tick repellent in your car at all times if you are a photographer going near the woods. Repeat, have tick repellent. Offer it to your client. Hey, are all parties agreed that we're going into the woods? You, you want some mosquito or tick repellent? I've got some in my trunk. And you offer it to them. Now if they decline, then Obviously, you're not negligent. You're not responsible. Is this hurting your head? Is this too much? This is so important. Um, again, not a lawyer, not an accountant, nor do I want to be, and I'm certainly not an insurance agent. Now, my insurance friend, Jen, was gracious enough to offer to do a live video with me in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to schedule that, and when I do, you're going to see a post from me asking for questions. I encourage you strongly to post any thoughts, ideas, questions you have about insurance and I will ask her those in our live interview and you can find it out right from her. She's fantastic. Some of you have met her. She's been here a few times, but I'm going to schedule that with her hopefully in the next few weeks so you can ask her anything. And you know, if you're thinking, I can't afford, and by the way, this is what people do. They say, well, I don't want to pay for insurance. I can't afford it. Do you even know how much it costs? No, because you haven't looked into it. You just say you can't afford it, but you don't even know. Insurance could start anywhere between $30 and $60 per month on one of these policies starting, and it could obviously go up from there depending on what you want to have covered. So this is not going to break the bank, but as Jen said, and I agree with this in insurance and in life, you can pay now 
or you can pay later, but if you pay later, the cost will always be higher. That's everything in life, everything. Pay now or pay later, but if you pay later, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. Any, any follow-up thoughts or questions to that insurance discussion, recognizing that you are not gonna to listen to me, you are going to get your own insurance person and find out exactly what you need because everybody is going to be a little bit different and everyone has a different tolerance for risk. Mine is extraordinarily low. So you will often find me periodically calling my insurance agent and or the underwriter directly posing a question so that I make sure I'm covered for any kind of wacky scenario. I am just gonna run through and check for anything else. Let me know if you have any other questions or thoughts. Hi, Tina. I hope you're well. All right, hey, you guys have a great day. Keep your eyes open for that insurance Q&A when I'm scheduling it and get your questions ready. I'll talk to you soon.